Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Pan-African Soybean Variety Trial Virtual Seed Marketplace. My name is Amy Karyanikis, and I'm the Communications Manager for the Soybean Innovation Lab, and will be your moderator today. Today's event is sponsored by the Soybean Innovation Lab, a USAID Feed the Future initiative focused on improving soybean production and utilization in Sub-Saharan Africa. We would also like to acknowledge our partners at the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture, the Syngenta Foundation for Sustainable Agriculture, and the African Agricultural Technology Foundation. Today, we are joined by registrants from 35 different countries, representing organizations within the private sector, academia, development agencies, and research institutions. Big welcome to everyone joining us today. Before we begin, I would like to give everyone a quick overview of the GoToWebinar software, which you can use to engage with our variety owners, ask questions, and access resources. Whether you're using the desktop or web application, you'll see a questions pane on your control panel. Please type in your questions as they arise, along with your organization and country. We will collect all of your questions and address as many as possible during the question and answer session at the end. Questions that are not answered during the live broadcast will receive a written response after the event is concluded. On your GoToWebinar control panel, you'll also see a handouts pane. Expand this pane to access today's presentation and the variety cell sheets we'll be showcasing today. Depending on your connectivity, you may experience a lag in the transition of the slides during presentations. This presentation and the cell sheets are available as PDFs in your handouts pane, so feel free to download those now and you can follow along at your own pace. Next, I'd like to give a quick introduction of today's presenters and the variety owners uh, before beginning the webinar. Uh, first off, we have Dr. Michelle Santos joining us. Michelle is the Pan-African Soybean Variety Trial Program Manager. She will be kicking us off with an overview of the PAT program. Thank you for being with us today, Michelle. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. So we also have uh, Yeshalu Seleshi joining us today from Ethiopia. Y Yeshalu will be presenting on the Clark 63K and SCS1 soybean varieties from the Ethiopian Institute of Agricultural Research. Thanks for being with us today, Yeshalu. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Hi, yes, hello. Thanks. Thank you, Amy. Next, I'd like to introduce you all to Dr. Godfrey Chigeza. Godfrey is a soybean breeder with the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture. It's a privilege to have you with us today, Godfrey. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, and uh, good evening to all the participants. Thank you. Uh -huh. All right, and we are also very excited to have Dr. Tegwe Soko a breeder with Seedco International Limited joining us uh, from Zimbabwe today. Tegwe will be presenting on the soybean variety SC Signal. Thanks for taking the time to be here with us today, Dr. Soko. Thank you, Ami. Welcome, everyone. I hope you will enjoy the webinar. Thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Nicholas Lacerna. Nicholas is with Samias Panorama SAS and is joining <laughs> us from Colombia. He will be presenting on the soybean variety Panorama 27D. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, everybody. And good morning for everybody. All right. And then uh, following today's presentations, we will have Dr. Peter Goldsmith moderating our question and answer session. So be sure to stick around. Uh, Dr. Goldsmith is the director of the Soybean Innovation Lab. Uh, thank you for moderating our Q&A today, Pete. All right, so um, now I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Michelle Santos to give us a brief overview of the Pan-African Soybean Variety Trial Program. Michelle, uh, please begin whenever you're ready. Thank you, Amy. So hi, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And as Amy already introduced, my name is Michelle Santos. I am the program manager for the Pan-African Soybean Variety Trials with the Soybean Innovation Lab. And a part of this management team, we also have Josie Franciscini, Erica Lelis, and the team at IITA in Zambia. And today I'll give you a quick overview of the program for you. Next, Jamie, please. 
Okay, the main goal of the Pan African Soybean Variety Trials is really to, con to connect sellers and buyers. So the sellers, they are from Africa and around the globe. So here we include city companies, IITA, NARS, universities, and government organizations. And the buyers are those individuals and organizations that are interested in registered lines coming from the Pan African Trials, sign license agreements and pay royalties back to the owner of the variety of the lines that were tested in, from the variety trials. So the path uh, now is in 20 countries and only in 2020 we already planted 95 trials um, across Africa and Myanmar. Next time please. So the Pan African Soybean Variety Trials provide a free part incentive system for breeders, seed companies, and farmers. So now um, the seed producers have access to a variety of different soybean lines that they can register, multiply, and commercialize. Not the only those old lines that were like registered 10 years ago. So, and now the breeders and the seed companies they understand the importance of having CD contracts and royalties uh, as part of the commercialization process. And now through these royalties payments, the public breeders, they finally see an opportunity for revenue going back to their breeding programs. This is gonna be incentive investments for the breeding programs to bring more lines that can also come into the market. Uh, and farmer, farmers finally they can see uh, seeds uh, with high quality seeds and improved varieties in their hands and this way improve their profitability. So the Pan African Sabine Variety Trial is really enabling across different countries in the Sub Saharan Africa to move, to shift from the um, seed uh, saving system to read a sustainable soybean seed system. And this is a really big step. Next. So this is just a quick overview on how the process works. So in the Pan African trials, the lines from different institutions, they are tested and the high performance lines, they are selected and they are open for registration um, a, according to um, alignments agreements between the buyers and the sellers. Then these lines are licensing and the royalty schemes are organized. Once these lines go to the market, the varieties are available and the bags are sold, then royalties go back to the owner of the Sabine lines and it will bring a revenue to their breeding programs. Next. So the Pan African Sabine Variety Trials started in 2015 in only one country and we planted only two trials. Now, five years later, only in 2020, we have 20 countries operating the Pan African Sabine Variety Trials. And now, only 2020, in October, we have 95 trials implemented and we are planning uh, to achieve 120 trials by the end of this year. And now we operate in Africa and also Myanmar. And we are expecting that in 2021, the Pan African Slavian Variety Trials you achieve 26 countries, including a country in Central America. Next. So when the path started in 2015, we had only one partner from the private sector. Now, five years later, we have 37 partners collaborating with the program. 20 from the private sector and um, 17 from the public sector. And in the path inventory, we have 174 soybean lines being tested across the countries. 137 from the public sector and 37 from the private sector. So the, the, through the Pan African Soybean Variety Trials and the, also the breeding programs that still provide support, already registered six soybean lines in Africa. And we have more 10 soybean lines under registration process in Cameroon, Ethiopia, Kenya, Malawi, and Zambia. And in more seven countries are advanced to registration, plenty on farm trials, collecting data to get ready for registration. Next. 
Today's marketplace showcases some of the best performing materials emerging from the past. Variety owners of these lines will share with you the performance and discuss their license and the commercialization requirements. Enjoy the webinar. Next. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, that was a great overview. Um, I'd like to just take a moment to remind everyone to please type in your questions into the questions pane of your GoToWebinar control panel and include your organization and country. We're going to address as many questions as possible during the Q&A at the end. Um, and as another reminder, this event is being recorded and that recording will be sent to you in a follow-up email after we conclude. So before we dive into all of the different soybean varieties we're showcasing today, uh, we'd like to pull the audience and see how familiar everyone is with seed contracting and licensing agreements. So we're gonna go ahead and launch this poll now. Um, we'll give everyone a few moments to record their answer. Okay, and we'll be closing the polls in three, two, one. All right, we're gonna share the results here. So it looks like, um, you know, 45% of you are somewhat familiar and 26% uh, very familiar with uh, seed contract and licensing agreements. So that, that's really good to know as we move into presentations on our soybean varieties. Uh, it's always nice to get a little bit of background on the attendees joining us, so thank you. Okay. All right, so uh, I'd like to now turn it over to Yeshalu Seleshi. Uh, Yeshalu is going to talk about some of the key performance metrics for two soybean varieties currently registered in Ethiopia. So Yeshalu, you're welcome to begin whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you very much, Ami. And hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, webinar. My name is Yeshalu Seleshi. I'm working in Ethiopia Institute of Agriculture Research at uh, Jim Agricultural Research Center. Uh, my profession is a breeder and uh, mainly working in soybean. Uh, currently, I have a national uh, Dolan oil uh, group uh, research program coordinators. Uh, Ethiopia is uh, one of the target countries in the Pan African variety trials. Uh, five lands uh, from Ethiopia are included in the Pan African variety trial and tested in uh, six African countries. From this, only uh, two of uh, our line based platform in uh, two African countries, namely in Kenya and uh, Malawi. Uh, one of our line based platform in Kenya called Clark 63K. Uh, it was tested over uh, four uh, locations in Kenya and one of the highest yielding among the 30 in Tari, which gives uh, 1.4 times higher yields than the average of uh, national checks, which uh, give yields. 3.3 tons uh, per hectare. It takes 134 days to mature. Uh, the line is uh, medium to late maturing uh, lines uh, based on uh, different agroecology. Uh, plant is 76 uh, centimeter, which is a medium uh, implanted and is not susceptible to uh, lodging. And uh, the line is uh, resistance to Sarcospora uh, leaf uh, blight. Uh, Clark 63K was uh, registered in Ethiopia in 1981, one of the most widely adaptable uh, lines and still in production. Next slide, please. Uh, the second uh, lines, line called uh, SC1, uh, which based performed in Malawi and uh, which gives uh, around uh, three tons per hectare, which is 1.1 times more yield than the average uh, national chicks. And it takes 125 uh, days uh, to mature. 
protein content is 37.9 percent and oil content is 23.2 percent which is maximum in uh, oil content plant yeast is uh, 73.3 which is uh, medium in maturity and uh, medium implanted and uh, not susceptible to uh, lodging uh, the material uh, is not uh, registered in Ethiopia, but one of the best performing uh, lines in Ethiopia. And uh, SCS1 is one of the biggest in seed size and attractive uh, seed color, which is important for uh, market uh, preference. Next slide. Uh, about licensing and uh, agreements, uh, in Ethiopia, uh, plant breeder uh, rights already approved and uh, from Kenya or from uh, Malawi, uh, any organization or institution, if went to uh, register those uh, soybean lines for production, has uh, licensing agreements and uh, royalty uh, agreements. And uh, after uh, agreement is reached, uh, reached, uh, we are ready to deliver uh, seeds. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Yeshalu. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Uh, we're getting a lot of great questions in, and we look forward to receiving more. So make sure you're entering your questions in the question pane of your GoToWebinar control panel throughout today's event. Um, I'd like to now uh, turn it over to Dr. Godfrey Chigeza with IITA. Godfrey, are you there? We'll give him just a minute. We see he's on. There we go. And Godfrey, you are yes. uh, welcome to begin whenever you're ready. All right. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Godfrey Chigeza. I work for International Institute of Tropical Agriculture. Uh, I'm based in uh, Zambia, Lusaka. Uh, but IITA head office are uh, in Nigeria, Ibadan. Uh, IITA soybean breeding program has been going on for over 50 years, and um, we have uh, released over 100 uh, varieties, uh, mainly for West Africa. Uh, you know, the hallmark of IITA soybean breeding or the trademark of IITA soybean varieties are the promiscuous nodulation. You know that they can actually fix the nitrogen uh, in the soil. The, and then thereby uh, very ideal uh, in rotation with cereals. Uh, as IITA, we believe that uh, smallholder farmers should also get a decent income uh, besides just growing uh, a staple crops. So soya bean is one of the, those crops which can actually provide a smallholder farmers with a decent income for them to be able to send their children to school or also to invest uh, in uh, staple crops uh, so that they can actually improve or diversify the agriculture system. Uh, as, uh, for the small farmers to get uh, good returns, they need to, to grow good varieties. And uh, this is why we're actually promoting our varieties so that at least we do, they do have genetic gain also in their field. Uh, this is the first wave of the soybean varieties coming out from the Pan-African variety trials. Uh, and the second wave, or the blockbusters, are actually in the pipeline. As we release more varieties, we actually get more. So today I would want to present two of the varieties, and one of them is uh, TGX 2014-16 FM. Uh, this variety performed very well in Ghana. It was uh, 1.1 times higher than the average national checks. Uh, in Ghana, it's actually... Uh, an early maturing variety, maturing less than 100 days. Uh, it was number one out of the 40 varieties which we had tested. Uh, the average yield across the seven sites where it was tested was 2.6 tons, uh, which is actually very good. Uh, if you look at the protein content, it's quite high in protein content. It is 41.4%, and also the oil content is very high, 22.6%. Normally, oil and protein content, you know, they they are negatively correlated. But on this one, it actually is it's both. You know, it's good both for, for protein and also for oil, which is actually good for, 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 for people who actually uh, want to use the variety as a feed or want to use the variety uh, in extracting the oil. Uh, the variety is also good with uh, shattering. 
Uh, next slide, please. Uh, it's also good with shattering. Uh, it's also resistant, more of resistant to a number of uh, biotic uh, stresses. Uh, the variety is also being uh, targeted for Zambia. So this variety is actually adapted to a wide range of um, uh, climatic conditions. Uh, in Zambia, it's also performing very well. Uh, in Zambia, uh, we are working with a, a private uh, seed company who, who is uh, interested in the variety and uh, they've started the process of registering it. So the average yield of this variety uh, in Zambia is 2.7 tons. Uh, and then the protein content, you know, you can look at the stability of this. You know, in, in, in Ghana, it was around uh, 41%. Uh, in, in Zambia, again, it's a 41%. So it's actually very stable. If you look at the results for the past two seasons, 2019, uh, 18 and uh, 19 and 2019 and 20, you see it was uh, out, outperforming the checks we're using, uh, the commercial checks we're using currently. So it's one of those varieties which is actually very good. But if you move it from West Africa to Southern Africa, it becomes, it falls now under the media maturity. So it's no longer an early variety. I mean, in, I mean, like what it performed in Ghana, but in Southern Africa, it's actually media maturity. So it's in the media maturity uh, category, uh, maturing in a less than 110 days, which is actually very good also for both the smallholder farmers and those who want to do commercial serving, uh, uh, I mean, production. The good part about this variety is actually, you can actually mechanically harvest it. It doesn't lodge. Uh, so lodging, it doesn't really lodge and also is quite uh, uh, resistant to shattering and also to leaf diseases like rust uh, so that you know the farmers would not incur additional cost in spraying. Next slide, please. So the farmers don't incur additional uh, in spraying. The next variety is uh, the TGX 1991-22F. Uh, this variety is targeted for Malawi. Uh, this variety is uh, very stable, very good for the smallholder farming uh, agriculture system or community system is very robust. Uh, it's uh, early maturing. Uh, the average yield for this variety is uh, 2.5 tons. Uh, uh, it, we have tested this. This average yield is uh, over the past three seasons. So it has been uh, outperforming uh, the current checks for, 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 for the past uh, three seasons in Malawi. Uh, it's doing very well. Uh, there's also one thing which I would want to mention is that see, most of the varieties we're actually having are uh, the serving varieties are quite old. So these varieties we're releasing are quite new. They will actually help the farmers to, to, to make a profit if they're actually uh, commercialized. Next slide, please. So if, if uh, so the availability of, of, of these two varieties, uh, we do have enough seeds for both registering the varieties, uh, both registering and also to kickstart uh, the commercial seed production or the certified seed production. Uh, this led, in terms of agreement, we actually use the, the CG system kind of uh, licensing agreement where we use the uh, standard material transfer agreements, uh, which can be uh, uh, I mean, exclusively, or we can actually negotiate on that. Uh, we, the foundation seed is available and uh, we are ready to deliver the seeds to anyone interested in this variety. The TGX 1991-22F in Malawi, it has already been registered through the government, through DAS, our collaborating partners in, 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 in Malawi. So if you need these varieties, you can actually contact me uh, in Zambia or contact the DAS people in, a, in, a, in, a, uh, in, a, in, in, in Malawi. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Godfrey. That was uh, super informative. Um, our audience is asking a lot of great questions so far, so please keep them coming. Uh, and again, please include your organization and country. Okay, so now it's time for our next interactive poll. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and launch that. All right. So. For our second poll, we want to know what is the biggest barrier to registration and or commercialization of a new soybean variety for your company or organization? We'll give everyone a few moments.
Okay, and we'll be closing the poll in three, two, one. All right, and I'll go ahead and share those results with you. Um, all right, so we have um, logistics and, and the time demands associated with registration kind of up in front here, but um, also access to suitable new uh, high yielding soy soybean lines. Okay, so great. Um, that is is great feedback. Um, it's important for our staff and our team of researchers to get this feedback um, from all of you. So we appreciate you participating in the polls. Thanks. All right. So we'll have one more poll before we get into the Q&A session of the event uh, with our moderator, Dr. Peter Goldsmith. But right now, I'd like to turn it over to our fourth panelist, Dr. Tegwe Soko. Uh, Tegwe is with uh, Seedco International Limited in Zimbabwe and is going to tell us about the SC Signal variety. Uh, Tegwe, please feel free to begin whenever you're ready. Thank you, Amy. Welcome, participants. My name is Tegwe Soko. I'm currently the acting All Seeds Program Lead for Sitco Group, of which All Seeds, we have a number of crops under that breeding program. We have soya bean, we have canola, we have groundnuts that we are also researching. And Sitco is a company that started in 1940, so we are celebrating 80 years in existence. And currently, we are operating in more than 15 African countries. And Sidco as a company, it has all the departments that are stretching from R&D in terms of crop improvement, variety improvement, in this case for soya bean. And also we have business units that cut across Africa. So in terms of seed production, marketing and sales, it's all done by Sidco in various countries. And then with this partnership with the CEO, it was it came at the right time for us because obviously it would also give us an opportunity to test in other countries where we don't have CITCO business units. Currently, we are testing in partnership with CIO in Cameroon. We are also testing in countries like Malawi in partnership with CIO. And through this partnership, we identified one product, which is SC Signal, that I will talk about today. SC Signal is an indeterminate soybean variety with a brown hilum color. And it is one of the products of the Sitco soybean breeding programs where we target high yielding varieties. So in terms of yield, it had a yield advantage of three tons across several countries. And it's one of the varieties which is very stable, always in the top five in terms of performance. So what I will do, I will give the performance of signal across three countries where CEO performed some trials. And the first country is Zimbabwe, where signal yielded three tons per hectare. And then the other characteristic, which is key for soybean is the lodging. It has to have good sustainability. And for the Zimbabwe results, it had a, a good sustainability of 1.8 on a score of one to five, where five is severely lodged, and then one was quite good with good sustainability. So signal was standing at 1.8. And as you can see in the slide, it was the best variety as compared to Spike and the Saga. But in terms of performance, it was comparable to Spike, which is the current commercial product that is being sold in Zimbabwe. In terms of maturity, SC signal is medium to late maturing taking about 117 days in these particular trials. And then also in terms of end use quality, which is also key for all expression, it did an oil content of 20.7%. And then for feed, especially livestock feed, it did a protein content of 39.1%. Next slide, Amy. The next country that we'll talk about is Ethiopia, of which in terms of our strategy, we are we are having hubs in Southern Africa, East Africa, and also West Africa. So in Ethiopia under East Africa, the same product SC Signal was about 1.4 times better than the national checks there, of which in terms of yield, it exceeded the three ton mark. It was 3.1 tons per hectare. And then in terms of maturity, 
I have highlighted two sites there because at one site it was early to mature, taking about 106 days at power. And then at GMA, it took 163 days, still confirming that it's a medium to late maturing variety. And then the other trait that is key in the seed core, soya bean varieties, is the resistance to soya bean rust. It's a trait that we have managed to introduce resistant genes into our germplasm. So in terms of the rust scores, it had a low rust score, even in Ethiopia, of which it's a good trait because farmers will not use fungicides in terms of controlling that particular disease because the genes are already there in the variety SC signal. Next slide, Amy. Then the next country is Malawi. Still, it gave us a yield of 2.9 tons, which is about three. It's a high yield, both Zimbabwe, Ethiopia, and now in Malawi, giving us 2.9 tons. And then in terms of end use qualities, it had a protein content of 37.7%, and then an oil content of 20.9%, which in terms of yield, it was 11.5% better than the local check in Malawi, which is Tikolore. And standability was still quite good, with a 1.1 score on a scale of 1 to 5. And then in terms of rust score, it's 1.3, which is also quite good. And it was the best in terms of rust scores there in Malawi. Next slide, Amy. Then in terms of availability, in terms of seed availability, like I indicated, Seedco is a private seed company that is also into seed business. So currently, all our products are being sold by Seedco in different countries. And the production, the marketing, the sales, they are all done by Seedco in different countries. And currently, we don't have a product that is available for licensing or for royalty issues. But if anyone is interested, they can always contact the Seedco persons in their countries. And you can also contact me so that I can link you for the availability of this particular product, SC Signal, which is high yielding, good standability, good end use quality, and also resistant to both uh, soya bean rust and bacterial blight. Otherwise, thank you very much for attending this webinar, and I hope you'll come and buy SC Signal from Sidco. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Tagway. Wow. So SC Signal is averaging a yield of three tons per hectare across those three countries. That's that's really impressive, really impressive. Um, so we appreciate you taking the time to share all those metrics with us today, thank you. Um, so uh, moving on uh, for our last presentation, we have Nicholas Lacerna joining us from SMEAS Panorama SAS in Colombia. Uh, he'll be showcasing the variety Panorama 27D. Uh, Nicholas, feel free to get started whenever you're ready. Um, we don't see your video, just so you know. Uh, good morning, AB. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon for the people in Africa. It's very nice to be here in this webinar. Thank you for inviting us to participate. I'm going to, uh, my name is Nicolas Lacerna. Uh, I, I live in Colombia, South America, in the northern part of South America. And uh, I want to present the uh, line Panorama 27 that it uh, was proved in several countries. It had very good uh, results in Nigeria and Ghana. So, uh, first slide, please. So, uh, Panorama 27 in Ghana produced two and a half tons per hectare, 1.1 times more yield than the average the national check. A, here the hip with its plant height was 71 centimeters with high protein 42.7 and oil content 22.3. Next, please. And and Nicholas, yeah. we don't we don't see your webcam. I just wanted to see if you could turn on your camera for the audience. I'm sorry. I said I see the other camera, so I thought it was shown. There we go. Now you can see? Great. Okay. Now, uh, Panorama 27 in Nigeria had a 
very good uh, result. Across sites, it was 3.9 tons. In in Ibadan, we have produced 4.7 tons. It's a very high yield for us here in Colombia. Uh, the, the plant uh, was a little lower than, than the one in Ghana, 55 centimeters. Uh, the weight was normal weight for this plant. The dodging was very low. This, this line presents a tolerant resistance to bacterial postule and mosaic virus. And uh, no, the, well, the maturity was 118 days. The yield across sites 3.9. And uh, next, please. We work in, in Sevilla Panorama, we work in, in looking for high yields or stress resistance or disease resistance for our uh, environment here in Colombia. We have been trying these varieties in, in Africa and well, we are very, very, Except my main English is not English, so I'm not very good, I'm sorry. We're very proud of the results and we hope we can do business with the African people and, and keep on continuing with the supporting the pay, PAT program. So we're open to for licenses agreement, we're open for royalties agreement, we have foundation seed available and uh, we're ready for delivery. You can contact me, there's a phone number and uh, our email. And, uh, and thank you very much. Great, thank you, Nicholas. We really appreciate you uh, being here today to tell us about Panorama 27D, so thank you. Um, so at this time, it is time to launch our final poll of the day. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. What communication platform do you prefer to receive Pan-African trial results through? We'll give everyone a few moments. Okay, and we will be closing the polls in three, two, one. All right, I'm going to share those results with you. Wow, it looks like the majority of you prefer um, that we share these results via email. So um, that is that is really helpful. Um, we realize that everyone's uh, preference is different, and uh, we want to show these important results in the most effective way possible. So thank you. So go ahead and hide that. Um, all right, so uh, now we're going to dive into all the great questions that you've all submitted. Um, I hope you stick around. Dr. Peter Goldsmith will be the moderator for our Q&A session today. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and let him get started so that he can try and get as many of your questions answered before we conclude for the day. Uh, so Pete, are you with us here? Here we go. I am, All right. So I I'll am go ahead and let you take over. Sure, sure. What a what a great uh, uh, webinar and a great line of products being being offered. And as uh, Dr. Santos mentioned, this is just the first wave. A uh, lot of good products that are really coming to the fore uh, and are available uh, uh, for um, for farmers. So it's pretty exciting. So this is. Everyone, we're, we're at uh, kind of day one here as, as this uh, uh, um, uh, cavalcade of, of, of varieties now are going to move forward. So it's very, very cool uh, to have these marketplace opportunities. So we have some great questions. Um, and uh, so um, uh, what we'll do is I'll ask the question to uh, one of our speakers. So speakers, be ready to turn the mic on and your camera on to, to answer. So I'm gonna 
ask Dr. Santos the first question that's come in. Uh, this one comes in um, from Apolline uh, Fatso from IITA in, uh, in Cameroon. Um, and he's asking uh, Michelle, um, what is the next step after having selected a variety from two consecutive trials? Um, can I share the data with the government? Um, maybe share the process of how the PAT data flows into what the government requires in, in many countries and so forth. Okay, thank you, Pete. Um, I think there are two different process here. Um, once the line was tested two different years or seasons in a country, I think we have a one first step, which is really the institution that is interested in registering the line will contact the owner of the Sabin line and discuss with it him and we can facilitate this process um, really to show the interest in register the line and start to discuss what's going to happen next if the line is registered because we want to really bring the line to commercialization uh, make sure that the, they have conversations about the foundation C license agreement but this is just a beginning not saying that we need to have this all done before registration but after this in terms of the technical part the registration process varies uh, from one country to another. So in some countries, we need only one station, uh, trial, others two, other three. And the, in terms of Cameroon, for example, after two years of planting on station trials, then you need to advance them to on-farm. So they, we need to have like data from on-farm trials. And the, if the soybean line is already registered in all the countries in the Western Africa that has the same agro agroecological, um, in the same agroecological zone, uh, you can already like write a um, registration proposal, including like the data from a station, your farm trials, and send for the government um, for analysis. This, if you have approved of the DUS and the VCU from the other country where it was already uh, registered. And this is going to go through um, the government. But if the line was not registered in other country that had the same agroecological um, zone as Cameroon, for example, then you need to send the, the, the seeds to the government and then you do the DUS and the VCU. So this is the same, like the government has also one step, um, for example, in Kenya, in Malawi, is all with the, the partners who is registered. So it really varies from country to country. Thank you, thank you, Michelle. Great um, question, great, great answer. Um, the um, second uh, question comes from Awet Estefanos uh, at um, uh, EIAR in uh, Tigre, uh, Ethiopia. This is for Yeshalu. Um, uh, Yeshalu, um, Awet asks about how we can get the new soy varieties uh tested in uh tigre uh ethiopia if i'm pronouncing the name of the, the the town correctly you can correct me if you want okay okay thank you very much uh actually we are working uh nationally uh two of the research center from tigre uh, have a strong collaboration with them uh, still we need uh, to work more and still we need to collaborate with other research centers if uh, the question is only to target to, to those lines, just uh, they may contact me and uh, uh, I will uh, deliver uh, the seed uh, without any license or uh, agreement. Thank you very much. Yeah, excellent, Nishalu. So on each of the cell sheets, there's the contact information for the breeder. So Yeshalu has his contact information. Um, uh, there, I'll wet so you can you can uh, reach out directly to him. Um, the next question is for uh, Godfrey uh, Chigeza at IITA, and this question comes from uh, Gordon Mabu Aye at uh, in Zimbabwe, and Gordon is asking about the IITA varieties that are being tested within the Pan African trials 
and he wanted to know, uh, are they available on an exclusive basis? Which is kind of a tough question because obviously it, it depends. But uh, what, how would you respond to Gordon on the IITA varieties for license? Uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for that question. We always uh, get uh, those questions. Uh, at the moment, it's uh, it's uh, not, uh, we can actually arrange an exclusive kind of uh, arrangement with uh, uh, companies, uh, private sector companies who want to produce those varieties or who want to commercialize those varieties. So the answer is yes, uh, that we can, uh, exclusive arrangements can be made. Uh, but uh, the issue with the IITA as an international public organization is that our aim is to make sure that the varieties reach the farmers. That's the main. If the improved varieties should reach the farmers. So the issue is like if you want an exclusive um, kind of arrangement, we also want to know, you know, the potential of that variety being distributed or being uh, marketed widely within a, a given, uh, uh, in, I mean, agroecological zone. Because in most cases, uh, we find that it, if we give people the varieties, they just put them on the shelf. It doesn't really help the breeding process. It doesn't really help, uh, you know, to show the impact you are doing as an organization. So we'd like to say exclusive, it can actually be arranged, but uh, we have to make sure that uh, those varieties are marketed as widely as possible, not to put them on the shelves. Thank you, Godfrey. Yeah, re really, really helpful. And um, there, there are a number of, just a couple of points on, on the questions coming in, lots of great questions. Some of them are uh, more general, which we, we're gonna answer all the questions and respond back to each of the questioners. So no worries um, uh, if we don't get to it uh, in, in, in this session. Um, uh, and uh, so, so not, not to worry there. Um, the um, fourth question, um, I'm going to throw back to, um, uh, uh, to, let me go first to Yeshalu, if you're, I don't want to put you on the spot, Yeshalu, but um, uh, Gordon and Mavoye from Zimbabwe is also asking a good question about the role of farmers and through the registration process and on-farm trials and how farmers uh, gain not access to the commercial seed, but are part of the uh, validation process, registration process. So I'll throw it first to you, Yeshalu, and then maybe I'll throw it to, to, to Gottfried and Michelle uh, after, because it's a good question about where farmers fit into the uh, seed selection to commercialization process. Yes, Lou? No. Good. Okay. Uh, I think uh, I understand the question is the farmer selection uh, based at Ethiopia. Yeah, so, so is our farmers, um, when you register a variety in Ethiopia, for example, say you take one of the Sika varieties and decide to go forward with registration because it performs well and, and you want to license it and sell it in, in Ethiopia, um, do the farmers participate either in field days? Do they have, are there, uh, farm of trials if the government asks the licensee to uh, perform? Uh, do farmers fit into the system in the registration process in, um, in Ethiopia? Okay. Uh, actually, uh, we conducted uh, at two locations, Ajima and Bawi, this uh, trial. Uh, farmers uh, was participated in the variety selection and have uh, they put their uh, selection criteria. Uh, uh, recently, uh, uh, only the governments has uh, 
trying to register uh, so such uh, best performing clients otherwise uh, uh, some only few uh, private companies are trying to register uh, some of these best performing clients uh, excellent and and so this is a, a a deeper question than maybe it appears um and i'll, I'll throw the question in a second to godfrey thank you yeshalu this is a deeper question that Gordon is asking. Uh, for the public sector, they want to involve uh, farmers and, and governments want the, the, the uh, research stations to involve farmers to, to, to look and decide what varieties they like and so forth. On the private sector side, those uh, companies are trying to sell seed. So they're directly engaging farmers in the process because if they choose the wrong variety, obviously they're not gonna have seed sales. So farmer acceptance is really, really important, uh, both from the public side as well as the private sector side. So Godfrey, from um, Zambia's point of view or IITA in your experience, um, where do you see the farmers um, how do countries bring farmers into the process? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very good question. And um, we do involve farmers um, in, a, in a number of ways uh, for us. Is, uh, one is to validate uh, whether our selection has also been uh, uh, actually meets what the farmers need, uh, what we call the product profiles we have created. We create these product profiles with the farmers to say the farmers, they want early maturing varieties, the farmers, they want uh, uh, varieties which do not shut, shatter, they want varieties which are large seeded. So the process of on-farm trials is actually to validate uh, what we have actually sort of agreed uh, on the product profiles with uh, the farmers. And also for the seed companies, it's actually a, a marketing tool. They can actually use that as a marketing tool that when the farmers select the variety, uh, they already know that variety is good they already know that this variety is actually a good for specific trades. And also the other issues like him, you find that uh, it's easier, for example, for us, uh, the case in Malawi, uh, the farmers normally is like, uh, they're actually the ones who normally names the varieties, like Ticolori, which means uh, let's, uh, let's farm, it, uh, let's cultivate. It was actually, that name was given by the farmers. They see the performance of varieties, then they can actually differentiate the varieties according to their traits. So it helps you to actually to, to classify the varieties. It helps you also to see which variety the farmers like based on gender. So it actually feeds back into the breeding program as a mechanism. What the farmers tell you about the, those varieties feeds back into the breeding program, feeds back into us designing the product profiles before we start uh, developing the hybrids. So this is part of uh, the uh, value for cultivation and use, which is actually very good. That's why we do the on-farm trials. That's why we actually use the farmers to validate that. So I would say it's like in some, in some countries, they actually uh, emphasize on on-farm trials that the farmers actually, uh, the data from the on-farm trials is used also in registering the varieties. In some countries, we only use on station uh, data, but the on-farm trials also helps us to measure the genetic gain, what we have done on the station compared to the performance on the farm. So it actually also gives us a good indication of the, the genetic gain on the farm also at the farm level. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, Godfrey, super, super ex, uh, explanation. Um, uh, yeah, we had, uh, yeah, I guess I'm a... So Abush, Abush is yeah. on and ready to speak. I think, Pete, you wanted to go to him next? Yeah, that would be great. I didn't know how to invoke him, so... Hello. Uh, hi, Abush. Yeah, Hello, speak. hi, everyone. Hello. Yep, speak loudly and introduce yourself. Hi, Abush. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, uh, my name is Abush uh, Tasfai. I'm a soybean breeder at IITA. Uh, I just want to comment on the variety registration process in Ethiopia uh, and also farmers' involvement in the process, you know, 
before any variety get registered the variety has to be has to pass uh, a testing of in more than at least uh, six locations in, in one year if it is a commercial varieties in some other country it has to pass at least uh, it has to be tested in six locations and then the uh, again it has to be also tested on farmers fields uh, for farmers evaluation so this we call it farmers variety verification so uh, otherwise it cannot be registered unless it is uh, evaluated by or tested across uh, locations so this is the uh, the process and I, I didn't really understand now the process of uh, marketing the, the varieties. Uh, is it the, the, the variety registration process should come first or is it the marketing of the variety, the licensing of the variety should come first? That's, I, I'm not clear because, for instance, the Panaroma 27D in Nigeria, we just only tested it for one season in two locations we are now testing it in about more than 10 locations to verify its performance one season data is not enough to really commercialize a variety and even with two locations so yeah this uh, is a and, good question abush this is a yes. good question and there's some other questions that came in uh earlier just general questions about this new space of licensing, registration, licensing, and royalties. Dick Tinsley had a number of questions as well, yeah. these general questions. So let me kind of, uh, let me answer yes. those best I can, and then we can follow up uh, as well uh, afterwards. Um, but the, um, what you're seeing here is how, um, seed um, marketplaces around the world behave. This is between a breeder and a licensee. And there has to be some, there is an agreement that the variety is worthwhile on the part of the licensee saying, you know, I, I, I want to invest in this, this variety. Uh, and registration then becomes important. So when um, uh, DARS in Malawi is registering uh, a variety, which they are 22F, they feel and their farmers feel, the industry feels this variety is really a, a, a good new variety for the country. So they will, based on using the data from the Pan-African trials. So you, seen the variety, you've seen it perform well, and the licensee, so not the licensor, so it's not the, the breeder saying it necessarily, but someone who's going to license it uh, and, and, and wants to market it will uh, engage, it has to be registered in the country. Um, and that's how in among the African countries where we're working, registration is a necessary condition. In other countries like the U.S., registration is it doesn't take place. It's just marketing a variety. But where we're working in Sub-Saharan Africa across the 20 plus countries, registration is necessary. The data from the PATS provide those data, uh, and the registration goes through, uh, and then um, license licensees then license that variety. Um, and then it goes through to uh, the discussion between the breeder, the owner of the material, and the licensee about the royalty payment. So um, someone who wants to produce 22F in Malawi uh, will um, negotiate with IITA and it's their call that they decide how big, small the terms and, and royalty agreements aren't just one line. They're, they're contracts. So they're, they're stipulations. So that's how that process works. So let's shift to, let's see, we have one minute 
left. I did want to get a question from uh, uh, the last question from uh, uh, Hillary Oteno of the One Acre Fund, who had a question for uh, for Tegway at Seedco. She operates in Kenya, Rwanda, Malawi, Ethiopia, Zambia, Burundi, Tanzania, Nigeria, and Uganda, and she's interested in uh, varieties, let's say Seedco varieties, that might perform well and would like to know how to she get in contact with you, get samples, and how the process might work. Thank you, Peter, for, for the question. It's like as a private company, we also need our IP to be. Sorry, I was muted. I was saying, Peter, thanks for the question. But otherwise, as a private company, there are issues of IP that comes into play. But that doesn't limit exchange of germplasm. Because if it is an experimental line, that is still to be registered. Even if we have protected, let's say, commercial right, for testing purposes, we can always exchange germplasm using the standard material transfer agreements, of which that agreement is only giving you the material for testing purposes only, so that yourself you can validate the performance of that material. And then if we want to move to the next step of commercialization, then another agreement can also be signed. That is the commercialization agreement. So in terms of evaluating experimental varieties in different ecologies, it can be covered by the standard material transfer agreement, which will state that you are only using that material for testing purposes. And then if you are interested in terms of commercialization, then we can also negotiate for the commercialization agreement. I hope it answers the question. Thank you. Yeah, really, really solid uh, answer. And, and certainly, um, Hillary, following up with Tegway um, uh, is, is, is a good way to go. We certainly can um, help as well at, at the Innovation Lab. Uh, ex, you know, explaining, working, doing some training, whatever you need to uh, 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 move into this space of licensing and 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 evaluating materials and and, and contracting. So, uh, thank you, Tagway. Uh, great, great answer and, and and great question. The um, the uh, next question. I was told we can go to ten ten, which is great because we still have a number of people on. And, and some great questions still. The, the next question comes from, uh, uh, ooh, I'm just scrolling up here, uh, from um, Faith Barr, here we go, uh, at uh, USAID. And uh, uh, Faith was asking, and this is for Michelle, um, asking about, um, uh, the locations. So these are, and this is an important question, especially for us in the soybean business, because location really matters uh, in uh, uh, soybean among soybean varieties. And we have lots of locations, though the sell sheet was really talking about how it's performing at the country level. So maybe help uh, Faith and others understand uh, the location available data that are really the essential data that you would, one would make in a licensing uh, arrangement? Yeah, no, that's good questions. We end up adding the cell sheets. Um, some of them have the pre-location, some just across location. We focus just more thinking about registration, but we do have the data um, per location and this is like a, available in our exchange reports so we develop exchange reports per country and per season um every year so when this you make then available to all the the 
attendees, all the participants of the webinar. And the, um, in the exchange report, you can see all the locations that were the lines were tested, how many lines were tested, um, specifics about the locations like GPS coordinates, elevation, um, dates for planting and harvest, weather conditions, soil results, um, and the, all the specifics per location. And the, if there is anything um, that would like to see that is not in the exchange report, please contact me and we will make this available through our database. Thanks, Michelle. Um, another question came up, and this is for, for Tegway, so get ready. And a Tegway, this is from um, a gentleman, and I don't know where Calvin Fabesaye Sayi is from. Um, and uh, so maybe we'll uh, I'll, I'll, I'll find that out. But Calvin is asking about exclusivity and licenses. So this is a very common thing that a licensee would want exclusivity. Um, uh, and and talk to it. Talk about this question of, and explain to Calvin why exclusivity is important um, uh, and when and where maybe it wouldn't be necessary, but why it's just a, a, uh, an important feature of a, a licensing agreement. Thank you for for that, Peter. Calvin Fabisa is one of our directors. Yeah, I just saw that. I just came <laughs> in. <laughs> Sorry about that. I don't know if I just put you on the spot with one of your colleagues. Okay. I wouldn't have done that had I known. But no, it's okay. It's okay. Remember, a COP improvement is a long-term investment. It might take 10 to 12 years developing one variety which means you you are investing but you are not maybe recuperating the expenses that you are investing in and then if a product is now commercialized obviously there are also some expenses in terms of marketing packaging everything else that seed companies also put into it that's why people when they are licensing now they want to have exclusive rights because at least they can invest in terms of marketing. Then they know they are the only ones who will be selling that particular product for a certain period of time. And that period will allow them now to recover all the expenses that they put through in terms of marketing. Because obviously for a new product, there are certain different strategies that you put in place in order to make sure that the product reaches the farmers and then obviously in terms of packaging everything else, the brochures and so on. So the exclusivity will give the company a period to recover whatever expenses they've invested in. I hope it answers the question. Yeah, really Thank good. you. Yeah, really good takeaway. And, and it's important, Calvin, that it, and, and, and the rest of the audience, that exclusivity is a two-way street. On the one hand, you want to have exclusivity to recover your investment, but the breeder or the owner only gives exclusivity if they think that the licensee is has the wherewithal the capacity to execute the license and really sell the product so they it's very important for breeders owners to evaluate their licensees to make sure that they have the the credit the capital the the sales distribution all the things that are necessary so that the product is handled well you don't want to take your good product and then um, give it to exclusive control to a company, and then they sit on the product. So it's a two-way street. The owner needs to understand the licensee, and the licensee, of course, needs to um, uh, uh, have access uh, to exclusivity to get a return on investment. So excellent questions, everyone. Um, I think that wraps it up on the on the Q and A part. Um, we will follow up uh, with answers for the questions that didn't get addressed. Um, but I'll turn it over to to Amy. Great, thank you, Pete, and also big thank you to Michelle and all of our variety owners, Yeshalu, Godfrey, Tegway, and Nicholas, for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, I'd also like to thank all of our great attendees for your interaction and feedback.
Uh, this concludes the Pan-African Soybean Variety Trial Virtual Seed Marketplace. Thank you so much for your participation. Uh, today's event has been recorded and a link to the recording will be sent to you in a follow-up email. When you exit the webinar today, you'll be asked to complete a short exit survey. We really appreciate all of your feedback and the time you've spent with us, so please just take a few moments to complete the survey. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and have a great rest of your day or evening.